Now let's get started with this week's film reviews. First up, we've got Forbidden Zone, directed by Richard Elfman, released in 1982. There is a story about the making of this film that few people know, and not even the superfans. I happen to live out in Los Angeles, and I work with various people in the film industry, and they've confirmed everything I'm about to tell you. As far as I can tell, this podcast is the first place this story will be told in public, so listen to this. When they were finishing Forbidden Zone in the late 70s, there was a post-production piece of analog gear, a film processor that was very expensive. It was cutting edge and made by a French inventor, and all over town the film studios were in a huge bidding war trying to get this thing so they could use it on their big-budget releases that year. You know, the directors of the most important films of 1982, like E.T., Blade Runner, and even Time Rider, The Adventure of Lyle Swan, were banking on getting a hold of that thing. But it turned out the French inventor was an intense fan of Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, Richard Elfman was part of a theater group in Paris in the 70s, and the French inventor used to attend their performances. And the live shows actually inspired the French inventor's work. Now, fast forward a decade, and that inventor heard that Richard Elfman was making his own movie. So he personally gave it to Richard Elfman. And Forbidden Zone would be the first film to be processed by it. And of course, the studios were furious. Now you're probably wondering, what was this device? Well, this film processor was one of a kind and very delicate, and no one knew how it worked exactly. And basically, it was an antique looking box. It was pretty simplistic from the outside. If you looked at it, you'd probably think, there's no way that this thing can process a film. But according to the instructions, you'd just load the master roll of 16mm or 35mm film into it, and it would process it pretty quickly. And it actually used electrical current instead of chemicals somehow. And it just had a single knob you could turn up or down. Written below the knob was the French phrase... Ceci nest pas un potard, which mysteriously translates to this is not a knob. So basically it was a surrealism knob and you could turn it up to add just a little bit more of a surreal vibe to a scene, you know, just a touch where it needed it. Well, Richard Elfman wanted more surrealism in the opening credits. It was something a lot of people did in those days. So he turned the knob up, but Danny Elfman was there with him and he misunderstood. He thought Richard said it was a serialism knob and he turned it back down because serialism wasn't a compositional technique Danny wanted to use for this particular score. Well, the Elfman brothers argued about it for a while, turning it up and down, up and down. And they got in a physical struggle in the editing bay, fighting over the knob, and they broke it. The surrealism knob got turned all the way up and stuck there. And the device overloaded, there was smoke coming out of it, and everything. So it was too late. The whole master roll of film had already been processed. And every scene was then stuck like that. In the end, they actually had to break the machine open to get the film master back out. And later when they watched it back, they were dumbfounded because the surrealism knob changed the whole movie drastically. And it came out looking like it was shot on a tiny musical theater stage. You know, all that money that Richard Elfman spent on the high budget locations around the world came out looking like hand-painted theater sets. 
the cave walls in certain scenes look like crumbled up black construction paper and elaborate sets appeared to be wooden flats that wobbled back and forth if a character leaned on them. And when characters flew or jumped through the air, you could clearly see the strings. And basically, elaborate action sequences with tons of special effects came out looking like Monty Python's stop motion. And most disturbing of all, Forbidden Zone wasn't even intended to be a musical. And of course, no one was ever able to use that strange film processing device again, and the inventor vanished, so it couldn't even be repaired. And realize, it's not like analog film can be unprocessed. There wasn't an undo button in those days. You know, you had to commit. In the end, the film came out 103% surreal. That's right, not 90% surreal. Not 99% surreal. Not even 100% surreal. 103% surreal. And if you watch Forbidden Zone, you will agree. The DGA even did studies that verified it did have that exact amount of surrealness. And it's not something anyone thought possible at the time or even since. Many others have tried to make a more surreal film than Forbidden Zone, and each time they failed. I actually heard that David Lynch spent a fortune trying to reconstruct his own surrealism knob, and he ran Twin Peaks Season 3 through it, turned the knob all the way up to infinity, but he only made it to 97% surreal, which was a major artistic disappointment to him. Anyway, I gave this film 5.15 out of 5 stars on Letterboxd.